dialects in so far back that we don't even know when. Uh, Athens and uh, the different city-states of, of the Greek Empire, uh, Ionia, Athens, we have Ionic and we have Attic. If you ever see in a Greek lexicon or something, it'll say Attic. That means that word, word comes from Athens. From Athens, we have what they call the dialects, and then we have the classical Greek, which is fantastic. By the time Alexander the Great came along in, in, uh, uh, in his life and conquered the world pretty much in 14, 15 years, uh, they were using what is called Koine Greek. Koine Greek. Koine Greek. Koine, we get our word common from it. It meant the universal language. A universal language. Everybody in the Middle East all the way to Europe spoke Greek. When Jesus came on the scene, the world was ruled by what? The Roman Empire. But the Roman coins were printed in Greek. I know you heard that Latin was a legal legal language. No, not really. It really wasn't. Greek was a legal language of the whole empire. Rome conquered the world. The Caesars conquered the world after Alexander the Great's empire broke up. But the Greek culture conquered the Romans. All right? And they loved it so much they adopted the the, politi the politics of it, everything. Uh, because it was gigantic. The democracy. The word, the word democracy, that's Greek, you know. Uh, anyway, from about 330 B.C. to 330 or 400 A.D., Koine Greek was the language of the world. The Old Testament, when Jesus was teaching, he used the Greek Septuagint. When you go to your different writings, you'll see this term written. LXX. LXX, many, many times. That means Septuagint. That's, talking about, that's, a, that's an abbreviation for the word Septuagint. Uh, <coughs> I know the movie The Passion came out and they had the people speaking Aramaic. That's not what was going on. They missed the boat. Just because something's on a movie screen doesn't mean it's right. Like I told you, the Young Guns and Young Guns 2, that movie, my, my cousin, my real cousin, Frederick Comes Away, played the Indian. He was a Chickasaw Indian in the movie. Okay? Uh, he was supposed to be, and that's the person that Lou Diamond Phillips was supposed to be playing. All right? He was not a poor Indian. He lived in a palace in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, a very Victorian home. He went out there, and they got a thought on the screen up there, and they have this Indian riding out there and everything else. He did have a Bowie knife, and he did have a gun, and he was a he was a, a gunfighter, but he was a marshal too, and a senator, <laughs> and attorney general, and the speaker of the house, and all those things. You don't hear that, but you see all of this. And the movie uh, True Grit and everything else. The last one that came out, he uh, John or John Wayne in the first one, and uh, Jeff Bridges in the second one. He said, "My wife wanted me to be a lawyer." Yes, my grandfather was a lawyer. He was a lawyer. He was also a judge. He also killed five white men, and they tried to hang him for every time he killed one. He killed seventeen, <coughs> and he killed five of them were white. The Indians didn't kill white people. If you killed a white man, even if you were marshal, they tried to hang you. And old Judge Parker tried to hang him five times. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just because it's in a movie doesn't mean it's right. Just because it's written in a book doesn't mean it's right. Uh, in your Greek grammars that are written by the German scholars, which they're, the German scholars were great scholars, but they made Greek German. The pronunciation is incorrect. I will give you the correct pronunciation when we speak it. All right. Uh, <coughs> what is that? In English, what is it? You. You, all right. In Greek, it's epsilon. Like that, epsilon. In German, it's like that. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, all right. It's like a Y in English, all right. The name, Kyrios. 
It's not kudios, it's kirios. All right? Like a why. I have a friend by the name of Podios Kiriakos. Actually, his name is Podios Kiriakopoulos. <laughs> Which means the city belonging to the Lord. That's what it means. This means belonging to the Lord. Kirios. Kiriakos is his name. All right, belonging to the Lord. And the word uh, Greek is so much different than the translations of the Bible. You, I mean, it's tremendously different. I, some of you people that have been in my class are going to be bored to death tonight, I know, because you've heard me teach some of the things I have, but I have to introduce these guys too. <laughs> the Bible, <clears throat> that would never be a Jehovah Witness. It never would have got started if they had stayed with the Bible. Brother Alan Wagner, how many of you know him? Brother Al Wagner? All right, he's one of our pastors here and everything. He introduced me to a missionary the other day from uh, uh, Russia or someplace. And he said, this guy here is the greatest Greek and Hebrew scholar that ever lived. He said, Jehovah's Witnesses don't last five minutes with him. <laughs> it's not that at all. It's that <coughs> you take the scriptures, the scriptures beat them up awfully fast. Uh, Bill, you just love when you when go with us come to your house. I you? kiss them on the lips if they come to my house. All right. Uh, it's oh boy, Harry. <coughs> I gotta excuse myself for a minute. My old camera is having a fit. Yeah, I'm zooming on. My old wore out machines are having fits sometimes. Hopefully it'll hold it in. We might have to get another piece of tape and put on it. I may have to get another camera here. Uh, see what happens. It zooms in sometimes. All you can see is a microphone. Where was I? Oh, Greek. All right, that's what we are teaching tonight, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. You were talking right. about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now knowing what they're talking about. All right. We do this in Hebrew and in Greek. Uh, what is the word for? Jehovah in the Old Testament. What's it look like? Jehovah. <coughs> All right. That's it, right there. How do you say that word? Anybody know how to say that name? Nobody. Nobody knows how to say that name. Okay. And in the Old Testament, the Jews, when they received the law of Moses, Moses gave a law, well, from God. And it says, Thou shalt not use the Lord thy God's name in vain. So from that period of time on, they were afraid to speak the personal name of God, which is Jehovah. We say that so easily because of King James, okay? But we don't know how to say that name. If you tried to pronounce it, it would be something like starting out with a yod. And that's it. Just breathe out. No, just like that. Now, <clears throat> when they came to this name, they referred to him as Hashem, or the word Ha the Bar, Ha the Bar, Ha the Bar. That's the E harder. See, this is a little different than the Greek. Greek's pretty easy. Logos is equivalent to that. All right, logos. See, that almost looks like him. See, that's a funny looking L and that's a funny looking G. All right, logos. So now let's go to John 1 and 1. I'm going to show you the difference between the English translation and the Greek translation. Because I don't know of any good Greek translation. The first time I showed this translation to uh, Brother Phil Neighbors, he looked at me and he said, Woo! He said, let me think about this. He said, write that down for me. So I wrote it down, and was just like I am doing up here. And he went and studied it, and he said, man, he said, that is dynamic. 
That's, that's that one verse is dying out. If you only have one verse in the Bible, John 1 and 1, you can preach the whole gospel from it. This, uh, <clears throat> this is a preposition. If you look on page 137 in the analytical Greek lexicon, you'll find that little word. And, it, and our English word looks a whole lot, sounds a whole lot like it. And it means the same thing. In is what? In is what? That's a preposition in English. Mm -hmm. All right? It's basically, in Greek, there's eight cases in Greek. Anybody name the eight cases? That, now, you don't have to do this all the time. Novity, genitive, obligative, locative, instrumental, dative, accusing, evocative. There's eight cases in Greek in nouns. There are many, many uh, tenses in Greek. All right? Very many tenses. In our case, all right, that's locative, singular, feminine word. In our case, that means beginning. All right, the beginning. In beginning period, there's no other beginning beyond that beginning, okay? Because this is locative, singular, feminine. And what is the word for beginning in Hebrew? Barashit. Barashit is plural in Genesis 1. Barashit bara. Elohim et Hashemayim we echo hearts. All right, that's that's Genesis one and one. It's different than in our case. This is the oldest verse in the Bible in time. John one and one. Kadi one and one. John one and one. In beginning, no further nothing exists in that period of time. On this little chart that I have on the. Uh, <coughs> The wall here is way back over here in eternity past, way yonder, way out there. Nothing else exists in this verse right here. In RK, in the absolute beginning of all beginnings. Now Genesis 1 and 1 says, in beginnings created, and that word created there is perfect tense. It says, in beginnings, in one of the beginnings, had created and brought to a perfect finish. Elohim, et, et is what is in, in Hebrew. I told you I was going to teach you Hebrew and Greek too. Et. Ace. Like that in Greek. That's a sign of direct object. There's, there's power going to that, okay? There's some action going there. That's like a, uh, a signpost is saying there. That's it, okay? In beginnings, created and completely finished, Elohim, that's the triune God, by the way, it's plural. Elohim, that Eve on the end of it, that's plural. The heavens. And actually, you could translate that the whole cosmos. The whole created order. And then it says, we are Haaris. And the sign of the direct object again, Haaris. Ha Aris, the earth. And Aris means what? What is that? Dry land. Dry land. All right. The heavens and heavens means uplifted waters. And, and here it really means the whole cosmos. And then it says, after he created the whole cosmos, then he took the earth and placed it right in the right place. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. And then it says in Genesis 1 and 2, we Ha Aris and the earth the earth she became formless and void. Something happens. You go back over there, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and you find out what happened. Satan rebelled. He destroyed the physical creation of God. And it became a, a total chaos. And then God, in Genesis 1, puts the earth back together and the heavens back together. And he places man on the earth. All right? But this happened way before any of that ever took place. This here is way back yonder. And then we have this little old verb here. Ain. In English, the translation is always was. That doesn't cut it. Forget was. It doesn't work. Okay? Kept on being. All right? Kept on being. That's very important. Third person singular and perfect indicative active. And that comes from Amy. There's a root of it. Right there. 
in the beginning, kept on being whole logos. Now, how should we translate whole? Whole is a definite article, by the way. There aren't any indefinite articles in Greek, by the way, only definite articles. That means a great big the. All right? Whole is called arthron in Greek. That's the Greek term for it. And then word logos. Logos is word. What's the word word in Hebrew? The law. What is the word that they refer to Jehovah as? The word or the name which is Jehovah. So we should translate that Jehovah. That's the way it should be translated. Now let's look at that first little sentence in John 1 and 1. Okay, what do you have here? In the absolute beginning, before anything else existed or was ever created, okay, kept on being the Jehovah. All right? And then we got a chi. That is a, a conjunction both times, some of the cumulative particle, and sometimes like a particle of affirmation. Okay? We so look that up on page 208 in your analytical Greek grammar. And it, here it should say and. And? Logos, a pros, pon, theo. This is the best verse in the Bible that I can think of to show you how important Greek is. That's why I'm showing you this, okay? And I don't think you need to memorize this in, indelibly in your mind. This will keep your faith, and any Jehovah Witness you ever run into, it might get them saved. And we do get Jehovah Witnesses saved there now, occasionally. All right, and whole logos. Now, I want you to look at this. This was Lockety's singular family. This is a preposition. That one you can look up on page 137. Here's this little uh, kept on being at the Jehovah. Now, this is nominee. Singular, masculine, definite article, okay? And this is nominee, singular, masculine, noun. The end here tells you what it is. And that whole, there's three definite articles in Greek, basically, to begin with. A masculine, a feminine one, and a neuter one. Whole, he, and to. He is feminine, and to is neuter. And ho, now this is all nominee singulars, okay? But there's also obligative, genitive, locative, instrumental, dative, accusative, and locative also. Right? <coughs> well, we have nominee singular masculine. So that tells you that's the case of the subject. Nominee was the case of the subject. In English, we have subjects and objects, don't we? That's it. In Greek, you have eight cases. There leaves no doubt whatsoever. Period. Okay? In absolute extremity of time, nothing else beyond that kept on being the Jehovah and the Jehovah. The Jehovah kept on being pro means what? Pro, when you're pro something, you're what? For it, or toward it. All right? Pros, toward, but that's not the idea here. Let's put down our toward, all right? Tone, this is accusative singular masculine, definite article, okay? The God. God? Here is a uh, like Elohim in Hebrew, all right? God. He kept up with Jehovah. Did Jesus ever cease being God? No. And this second, the second sentence, there's three sentences in John 1 and 1. And the Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. Okay? That's what it's talking about. Jehovah, Jesus, kept on being an inseparable part of the Godhead. Then the last part of the verse, can I erase this? Is that all right? I can't see the bottom. Okay. <coughs> Got that? <coughs> can I erase the part, the top part? I'll start back over. 
All right. I hope this is doing you some good. Then we start over the third verse, the third sentence, actually. Kai, Ko, Logos, Pain, Fields. This here is a tremendous sentence right there. Is even or because here? Look that one up on page 290 again. Remember that in the analytical reflection. Because, and this is what you call a predicate nominative. A predicate nominative in grammar. A predicate nominative. And the, the, how should we pronounce this word logos? Jehovah. All right, Jehovah kept on being, being God. Their Hebrew equivalent is what? Elohim. Elohim. Now, what a predicate nominative, I'm going to tell you what a predicate nominative is. It means the subject here and the subject there are the same thing. Now, let's look at this. Whole logos. That's nominative, singular, masculine, isn't it? All right, you can look it up. All the grammars will tell you that. How about theos? That's nominative, singular, masculine. Now, right here, mathematically, Cindy is a mathematics teacher, professor. What does that mean? That's real hard. That's equal. All right? Equal. And what this means mathematically, here, nominally singular masculine, there's the definite article right there. Now over here, Greek is not redundant. It doesn't have to say the same thing over and over again. You can do this. You could put whole fields there. And you're not going to do violence to Scripture because it's there. It's there, whether you see it or not. It doesn't make any difference. Because this person right here and this person right over here are absolutely the same person. They're, they are the same person. Whole logos, one equals one. This one over here, nominative, singular, masculine. The definite article describes this person over here. And it's a predicate nominative. That's the same subject here on, uh, in front of this equal sign that's over here. Now, what did you just do to the Joe Witness, the theology? You destroyed it. It's gone. <laughs> it's over. Right there. Kai homo go sarks again, though. What is that? Kai homo go sarks. Can I erase that yet? Okay. Kai homo go sarks again, though. Where is that found in the New Testament? John 1.14. John 1.14. <laughs> John, 1, 14. John was really good. Kai, Ho, <coughs> Logos, same guy. Kai, Ho, Logos, Sark. Again, so. And. You got that figured out yet? Kai is really easy. It looks just like in English as it's like it does in Greek, doesn't it? You didn't have to learn the new language to learn that one. My uh, tail there didn't come out too good. And, what is this one? Uh, all right. And what is this word? Logos. Logos, which should be translated what here? Jehovah. Okay. And the Jehovah. The, how many Jehovahs are there in the Bible? One. <laughs> That's it. And the Jehovah, Sarx. It's carne in Latin. Yes. It's right. flesh in English. It's Basar in Hebrew. Okay? It's, it's, and all those languages means the same thing. What does that mean? Flesh. Flesh. Basar. Carne. <coughs> All of that. 
Okay. Carney Assault, what do you got? <laughs> in Spanish, it means flesh, meat. All right. And the Jehovah Sarks, he became. Became for himself. That's beautiful. You see what the Bible, what the Greek can do with how powerful Greek is now. It's very powerful language. The Greek, the Bible in Greek, you're not going to make a lot of mistakes. If your theology is correct, and you read it in Greek, if your theology is correct, it's going to agree with the Bible. If the, Bi if the Greek leads you some other direction, then you better lead your theology with it. Simple as that. But again, you know... In, in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew... I believe in the inspiration of the Bible, the total inspiration of the Bible. The Bible, I believe, is inspired in every tense, mode, and voice. In Greek and Hebrew. Absolutely. It's beautiful. The further and the deeper you chase it, chase it, the more your, your faith is going to stand on, on, on a solid rock. Used to, uh, when I was going to school... You had to have five years of Greek and Hebrew to, tra to graduate from the seminary. I had nine years of Greek in class, and I had six years of Hebrew in class. And it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. I just kept on going. Oh, uh, you know, in the first chapter of Genesis, you start using the word Elohim, which is plural. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that with what you've been telling The Godhead. So the Godhead is Jesus never ceased being God. He was always part of the Godhead. So okay. He was inseparable. Post on the only, remember? Yeah. He was inseparable part of the Godhead. He always was God. He didn't cease being God at any time. Not on the cross of Calvary did He cease being God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit tasted and felt that cross for you. But then they the, tasted and felt it for you. When He says in, in Genesis 1, let us that's right. So it's there's, plural. there's a plurality. That's that is a verb in the, in God the world. God. Yes. Yes. That's the triune God. That's the triune God. But there's only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is aha. One God. One God. That means one. There aren't three gods floating around out there. The only God you're ever going to see is Jesus. That's it. That's all. All right, Brother Bill. Jim, could that be down here this uh, John 14, could that be, as the glory of the only God with the Father, could that be interpreted as the only expressed image of the Father? The only begotten. He was the only one. God only begot himself, begat himself one time. That couldn't be his yes, express yes. image. What? I'm asking, could that be interpreted as express image of God? He is the pressed out image of God. The invisible God we see in Jesus. The invisible God Moses saw. The invisible God we look in the book of Genesis here by, while back in even Hagar saw him, didn't she? And she named him Jehovah Roi, hmm. the Lord my shepherd. But You'd be surprised what you see in the, in, in the, in the scriptures. Boy, the you'll learn a lot. The early church fathers, in essence, said that God is one in essence, but he is three in person. We see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we're only going to see one God. One God. Sitting on the throne up there, and that's Him. He is the image of God. He is... We are made in His image. How many of you are there? Huh? You're triune. Your mind, soul, spirit, and body. What am I going to see about you? Is your form. God made us in His, in the Hebrew it says, in His shadow casting likeness, and His what, Cindy? Blood flowing likeness, and what else? And His spiritual image. That's it. The best way to explain God is to just look at yourself, because God made you in His image. Okay, that's it. He made you in His image. So, John 1, 14, uh, Bill. Read, are you open there? Yeah. Okay, read the, all of that verse. And the word became the way the way that you taught me to read it. Uh huh. And 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 the Jehovah became flesh. All right, hold on right there. The word became is third person singular. All right, in verbs, you're going to learn a little English in this class too. There's first person, 
second person, third person singular, it's singular here, and then plural over here. All right? It's I, you, you she, he. You see, I thought girls first. Because we got a lot of girls in here. He, or she, he, and it. All right? And over here in plural, third person plural is we, you all. That's good Oklahoma. Yeah. They. All right? And then what? They. All right. That's the way it is. So this is third person singular. He, he became. He became. All right? For himself. How do I get for himself? The word became there is aris tense. Aris tense is what? Punctiliar. First aris is knife blade. Second aris is a little bit wider, but punctiliar action. Middle voice means what? Middle voice. You doing it for yourself. All right? Here's the action. Here's the voice of it. We have a uh, middle voice coming right back on yourself. We have passive voice that somebody's acting upon you. All right? And active voice, you're doing it for yourself. All right? The middle voice is direct middle. God brought himself, Jehovah brought himself into the flesh by himself. He begat himself. Read the rest of it, John. I mean, uh, what's your name? That's, all right. That's the best thing Joanne's ever called me. And the Jehovah became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, the word uh, uh, dwelt among us, it, it literally means he pitched his tent. In the tabernacle, it says that God wanted to dwell with his people, so he pitched a tent. All right, that tent, that tabernacle represented Jesus to come. All right? It says he pitched his tent. He dwelt among us. He tabernacled above, uh, 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 with us. And then John 1.18, we'll go to John 1.18. Uh, Brother Bill, are you over there? Let's let you read that over here. John, John, John 1.18? 1, 1, 1, He's the bill? No, no not this bill. bill. This bill. All right, now let's straighten that out. Okay, now look on your Greek translate and look at your Greek there. Okay. No one has seen God at any time. Okay, now what does it say? Monogenes. The only begotten or generated what? No, no. What's it say there in Greek? Don't forget the English. <laughs> the only begotten God the only begotten God he has led himself out comes from Ek in English Ek and Ago alright out Ek we get exit signs Ek means out of out of it exit he led himself out middle voice again he led himself out of eternity into space and time right over here. Now, Jesus appeared to Adam in the garden, didn't he? In his pre-incarnate form. He appeared many times in the Old Testament. He appeared to Abraham. He appeared to Hagar. He appeared to Jacob. He wrestled with Jacob, didn't he? Ish, Ishra'el. Ishra'el. Let's look at that. Ishra'el. <clears throat> We're playing with words tonight to introduce you to this class. Israel. All right, Israel. What does that come from? What does it mean? It's a prince with God. L on the end of it is God, isn't it? Right? It means prince, doesn't it? But what does prince mean? Sarah's name was princess. Sarai. Sarah. Israel. All right. Sarai. Sarah. All right. Israel. Comes from the same word. Which means to wrestle, to fight. A prince is a victor over an area. Alexander the Great was a prince that had many diadems flowing from his crown. He had a crown, but he had ribbons with diadems flowing. 
And every time he conquered an area, they cut another ribbon on his crown. And in the New Testament, in the book of, of Revelation, we have Jesus standing there with a stephanos, with a crown, with many diademos on it. Mm-hmm. All right? The word prince means to wrestle or to conquer. The man who wrestled with God, he wrestled with God. And God gave him a name of he wrestled with God. He wrestled. Sarai meant what? Contentious. Uh, ready to fight at all times. Sarai. That's what it meant. She was ready to fight at all times. Her name meant contentious. It means wrestler. It meant uh, uh, explosive. That's what she was. She was explosive. She had, a, she had a violent temper. Just look in there and read it in Hebrew. You will find it. All right. Romans 10 and 10. We got to get someplace. Turn in a few books to Romans 10. 10. <coughs> cardia. 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 See that word cardia there? Is there something in English that that word cardia comes from? Yeah. All right. The, the word cardia, or cardiac, or cardiologist, all of that. A cardiologist is one who studies the heart. All right. Cardia. Gar. Pistio ete. Ace. The Kyle Sune. Stomachic. Day. Homologete. Ace. Soterion. All right, we're going to look at these this verse here a little bit. In heart. That is locking his singular feminine. In the heart. In the heart. In the heart. In your heart is what it says. And what it's talking about is your innermost being in your soul is what it's talking about. In your soul. Man is triune. He is body. He is soul. We got our word psychologist from the word psyche in Greek. Psyche. All right. The body. That's the sark. Or the basar. We have body, we have soul. In the soul is the mind. That's your consciousness. And then we have spirit. Spirit in Greek is what? Spirit. What do you got an air tool? What kind have any of your mechanics? Anybody yeah. do any mechanics around here? You knew about mechanics? Yeah. When you have an air tool, when you have an impact wrench, that's a pneumatic yeah. tool. Pneuma. Yeah. Yeah. All right, pneuma. We have pneumata or pneuma. We have spirit. And in Greek is what? I mean Hebrew. Ruach. Ruach. All right. Ruach and Ruach. So we have sarks. We have soul or mind. And we have spirit. How you get saved. When you get saved, the old spirit that was in you, that was damning you to hell, the Adamic spirit, the spirit of rebellion, is kicked out. And the spirit God comes and dwells in you. And that's what marks you for the resurrection. And as a child of God. All right. And what all the way from the Old Testament to the New in heart, in your innermost being, in your soul, for in your soul, one, now that's what we call a practical substance, because it's understood. It is third person singular, present, indicative, the voice. <laughs> what does that tell you? There's volition in salvation. There's volition. There's, some, there's one little tiny part of that that's volition. We know that God elects, and we've been studying the election of God. We foreordained and predestined. I preached a sermon on Sunday morning, foreordained and predestined. Yes. In eternity past, God knew everybody was going to be saved and put their names down in the Latin book of life way back in yonder eternity before he ever created anything. That's where N-R-K, a whole logos was. Long time ago. But in space and time, there is a certain element in you that gives in to God. That, that volition, that will, that will. For in heart, one, he, or one, believes for himself. It is third person singular. Remember, third person singular, that's he. Present tense is what? When you believe, you believe, don't you? How long does that last? Forever. You're going to believe from now on. You know, a child of God, when he's first saved, he believes. 
But if you, as you study the Word of God, the Word of God gets more real to you all the time, and you just it just absolutely establishes your faith. That's what I, I said earlier. When you study Greek and Hebrew, all it does is put a tremendous, great, big rock foundation underneath you. Like that throne of God in the book of Revelation, that sea of glass. You hear the sea of glass and I'm going to throw the guy. You know what? It, it means the throne foundation was diamond. It was a great big diamond. Diamond's basically the hardest thing there is in it. What kind of foundation is that? Is that pretty firm? Yeah. Who was the rock in Matthew 16 and 18? Jesus. Huh? It was Jesus. Peter was not the rock. No. He said, you are Petros, a small stone. But upon this gigantic Petra, I shall be building my church, and the gates of hell shall not wrestle her down. That's the kind of stone, big one, like the rock of Gibraltar, like the foundations for the throne, on that throne was set on. For in the heart, he believes ace, the kaiosune. Ace means what? What is that sentence? Extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. That's a grammatical idea. Sometimes it means because of. Sometimes it means into. Through and beyond. The word ace is really hard to translate. It's kind of like the word. So here we have the word ace. It looks just like it does in English, doesn't it? You don't have to learn any Greek to get the word ace, did you? All right? But in Hebrew, it's this. Et. Et. All right. Ace. Extension and limitation of thought or verbal action. Into and through and beyond. You believe how far? Through all the way into heaven. <laughs> That's how far. All the way through space and time and into eternity and future. That's how much you believe. All right. And that's what the idea is talking about. The idea of this extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. Here is what it does. It just starts way back over yonder at the point of belief. When you believe, until your action, you believe it. There's a point that you're saved, all right? And from that point, you believe all the way on and through to the eternity of to Hashemayim, to the heavens and the future, the eternal future. <coughs> Unto righteousness is dekaiosune. That means what? It comes from dk in Greek. That's the root of it. Dekaiosune. That's your very word, isn't it, Cindy? That means righteousness. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. What does that mean? It comes from malak, which means king, and tadak, which means righteousness. That's the word in, in Hebrew, and then the word in, in the New Testament is dekaiosune. Dekaiosune. Right? Righteousness. It means that God looks upon you as if he's looking upon his son. You're just as absolutely righteous as Jesus is because his righteousness was transferred to you. Isn't that beautiful? That's it. That's the way God looks at you. He looks at you as a finished product. Stomatic. What is the door to the stomach? The mouth. The mouth. We got our word stomach from this word because that's the door of the mouth. All right? Stomati, with mouth, by the agency of the mouth, instrumental. Weak adversity conjunctive particle. Page 85, if you go look, that's day. Day looks a whole lot like it would in, in English, doesn't it? There's the English. How do you do it? D, but I can't remember. <laughs> D. You like this? Yes. Okay, D. All right. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, looks just like an English D with a little tail on top of it. All right. If Kyle soon they with, with your mouth, and then homo logete. Homo means what? We saw that word last week. Homo means confess, same. Confess or say the same as. All right. Homo means same to say. Yes. God already knows you're a sinner, doesn't he? You're not going to, when you confess your sins to God, he, you didn't tell him anything new. All you do is say the same thing that, that he already knows. That's what confession means. Ace soterion. All right. Now, 
We pray out loud sometimes, don't we? I think more people were saved praying from the heart than they would from their mouth. You know that? But it's really, you can pray from your outside. I mean, some people leave other people to the Lord. In 1961, when my grandmother got killed, I felt like I was just absolutely had no foundation left underneath me. I mean, I was in terrible shape. I just didn't know what I was, what my future was like. And I went to church. And I went to this little old uh, charismatic church. And I'm going to tell you the truth. The Lord was working with me, His Spirit, from the hospital where she was dying. She got run over by a drunk driver. And she was in the hospital for a week and died of pneumonia. Anyway, up there in that hospital, I... I'm going to turn this old fashioned one over. The Lord was dealing with me right then. When I uh, I went to church, I tell you the truth, they weren't preaching much Bible that day. They were all excited. They were doing all kinds of stuff. But they weren't preaching much Word. Anyway, at toward the end of the service, I just walked down the aisle. And I'm going to tell you something. I was bashful. I didn't talk till I was 30 years old. You may not believe that today, but I was about 30 years old before I started even hard, hardly even opening my mouth. Anyway, I walked down there and my ex-step-grandmother came down to the altar with me. And she said, Jimmy, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I think I want to be saved. And they, were doing, they weren't interested in me from the pulpit at all. They just weren't interested in me. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have known what to do, but the Lord prepared all that anyway, regardless. Okay? Anyway, so she said, well, what you need to do is to pray and ask the Lord to forgive your sins and save your soul. And I did. And I just felt brand new. I wasn't near so worried after I prayed than I was before I was praying. All right, we're making it. Now, we're saved. You know, this happens in punctiliar action, night late action. In the heart, for in the heart one believes, for himself, unto righteousness. And then it says, and with the mouth, is, he is confesses ace. Ace here should be because of salvation. Mm -hmm. Because you've been saved, you confess. All of this takes place so fast in your heart that you don't understand anything about it. But there's something that's very important in salvation. You've got to repent. Without repentance, that's the word confessing. You repent and you ask God to forgive you because you know you were bad. You were bad. We are no good. Let's look at one more verse, okay? We got started late, so let's stay a little bit long. We'll make up for it. Is that all right with you? Sure. Okay. All right. Then in verse 11. Genesis 22 was the regular, the, the cross reference to that last one. Romans 10 11. Legay. Gar. A. Grape. Pos. Ho. Pistion. Et. Alto. Who. See how we're doing? Looks just like it does in English. If it was English, you would never know any different. Cot, pace, ke, ne, se, se, te. That's a hard one right there. All right. Legay. For what it says, third person singular, present, indicative, active, O S A O and A D O C, is the is the conjugation of present, indicative, active. Okay, you don't have to learn all that stuff. I did a long time ago. For it says, it says, third person singular, it says here, now what is the it? Why am I saying it? Or she is what it literally says. What does she say, the scripture, the writing? Grape. Mm -hmm. All right? The word grape. Do we have any English words that come from this Greek word? Grape. Graphs. Graphic. All right, graphite. Graffiti. Yeah, graffiti. <laughs> All of this comes from this word, graphite. 
which means writing. Graphite. You know, the, if you've got a lock that's really um, giving you troubles getting kind of stiff, you can take a pencil, an old lead pencil made out of graphite, and just scrub that on there and put that thing in and turn it a little bit and it'll lubricate it up. That's like graphite. Okay? Well, also, in your pencil, for writing. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's graphite. Yeah, the old lead pencils, yeah. you just, that's got graphite in it, okay? All right. For, it, for she says the writing... All the ones believing, all the ones pistio, the ones believing. Look at that word, nominative, singular, masculine, present, participle, active. The ones believing. Remember what I told you about believing? From the point in time that you are saved, you believe from that on time on. You know, the old devil will come and he'll put doubts in your minds, but in your heart you still believe. There's hardly anybody I ever known that was saved and think they had to get saved some other time in their life. You know, when I was young like that, I had no scriptural background at all. I wandered along for about ten years and didn't even know that I was eternally saved. I thought I had to get saved over every time I sinned. <laughs> what theology I had in the background. You know. Well, I saved just once. That's it. For what she says the writing, all the ones believing, epi, that's a shortened form of epi, epi pacing. 153 and 4 in that analytical verse. That means upon. It's a preposition. Upon him. Who's him? Who's him? Jesus. That's the word Jehovah. That's our Savior. How do you get saved? If you ever got saved, if you ever will be saved, you're going to be saved by the merits of Jesus Christ and him only, not by what you do. That's it. You're going to be saved by Jesus' merits. Not that word, look at that little adverb of negation there. It comes from ook, page 294. That word u, it's short in form there. And then kata, ka, te, skid, de, se, tai. Oh, it's third person singular, future, indicative, past. It comes from ka, te, skid, no. It means to turn blushing red. Mm -hmm. You will not blush. Right? The ones believing upon Jesus Christ will not blush, will not be ashamed before God. Will not be ashamed. Very beautiful. One more verse, and then I'm going to turn you loose on the world. Go out and do something eternal. Is that enough, Cindy? One more verse. All right. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yar. Yeah. Esten. Diastole. Udia. Te. I. Helenos. Ho, Gar, Altos. You can look at Altos and it looks just like it does in English, doesn't it? And then Kirio, Anto, Pluto, Ace, Anto, Tus, Epikalu, Manus. Alto. Now, in English, our language doesn't quite start like it does in Greek. It says, not for is. Actually, the way we look at it in English, it says, or not is, diastole, difference, a distinction. There is no difference between eudeon, all right, eudeon, no difference between a Hebrew or a Jew, both also of Greek. Helenos. The word Greek is not Greek, it is Helenos. Like Helen of Troy. Alright? Oh, Helene. Yeah, Helene. That means Greek. Alright? The real word for Greek is Helenos or Helene. Alright? It's not Greek. Did you know that? Did you learn that? That's that brand new tonight? Alright. Hellenic culture. Hellenic cultural centers. Greek cultural centers. Alright? For of Greek. For the one, him, Lord of all. For he is Lord of all. For he is Lord of all. Richly abounding. Present participle active nominee singular mouse. Richly abounding and overflowing. And here we have the word ace again. Look at that word ace. Extension limitation of thought or verbal action. Unto all the ones calling upon him, calling upon him effectively. Jesus died for all men. But only those that will call and repent will effectively are part of the elect. 
as simple as that. And calling upon him. Accusing scene, plural, masculine, present, participle, middle. The one. And that definite article in front of that two epicoluminos. See that word two there? That agrees in number, gender, and case with the noun, or actually the participle here that it's describing. That participle there is like a fluid verb or noun. It's a noun with action. See, it's present, participle, middle voice. But it is accused of plural and masculine. It's, it's declined like a noun, but it also has verb characteristics because it does something. All right. Well, I hope you learned something tonight. We'll take off in 10 and verse 13 next week. I had to give you a little introduction. We have quite, How many of you are new tonight? Got quite a few of you. I hope you enjoyed the class. Hope you come back next week. All right, and this is uh, 9 and what, what's the date? 14? All right. I remember many years ago, there was one time, uh, Brother A, when I was only teaching Brother Soul in my yes, Romans class. And in that letter that we that I you read from Korea the other day, he said that I was teaching Romans. So that's who I was I was teaching this in nineteen seventy something. Somewhere you'll see a date in here. Where? Nineteen seventy seven. Nineteen seventy seven. That was a long time ago. All right. Do you have any questions? This this class goes on all year long. I don't ever quit it. Yeah, it doesn't quit. You, he goes all summer through the vacations and everything else. I'm usually here if I'm alive. I uh, when I, they, what was it, what is your name, Michelle? Michelle. Michelle. You asked me if I had cancer uh, about what was it eight or nine years ago? They took me down there at uh, at uh, where was it? Clark St. Joseph, they're down there with the movie stars. I got to go in the hospital with the movie stars down there in Burbank. And uh, they chopped me all up. They gutted me and put me back together. And I had IVs running in me and catheters running out of me. And, and my wife drove me home, and then we got back here to Bakersfield. I was in the hospital for nine days down there because they really did a number on me. I could kill them. Gave them the wrong medicine to everybody. Oh. Anyway, uh, my wife got me up here. We came up on Monday, <coughs> and on Wednesday, I said, take me to church. I'm going to teach my Greek class. <laughs> and I was in my pajamas with a calendar and a tie and everything else, and she got me up there. Now, I think on the website, there's a lot of pictures on the website. You go on, there's two websites, actually three websites. And here I was, and when I walked in there, they said, <laughs> I, said I had somebody taking my place while I was doing that, but he really was just... He said, he said, I'm playing Greek. But you know what? I couldn't see. I had, was so anemic that I could not focus. So I had to do everything by memory uh, in the class. But we just went on. I don't know what in the world was teaching. I think first or second Peter at that time. But if you if you want to go to discovertheword.com, you can listen to 2,000 classes with me teaching on there. Uh, from the Gospel of John, uh, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Peter, uh, uh, the book of James, Hebrews, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, we did gobs of classes. Our next class here, we're going to go right straight from uh, Romans into 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians is a really uh, exciting book. And I just left the master off over there. I did all of the books of the New Testament, all the books, and I did them in, in anal linear just like you have in front of you right now. I I apologize for my poor handwriting, but I think you can probably, if you really want to learn it, you can read it out there, and you can look at your Bible. And Hebrew, I have to say this one thing about Hebrew. Cindy, what about my Hebrew writing? It's better than the text, isn't it? Yeah, I, I actually Greek is too. I can read it. I can read your Greek and Hebrew better than I can read out of the book. Yeah. Anyway, the Hebrew, I really make it distinct. You can't write English, but you really can't. <laughs> I get to talk in Indian or something, <laughs> a little Latin and, and a little Germanian every now and then. You know what German means? What's German mean? Spearmen. 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 They were the men with the long spears. That's why they got the word German, spearmen. I'll throw a little thing in here, a little bit of a, of a exciting Wild West stories and wild Indian stories, a little bit of everything else with you every now and then. All right. If you are interested in one of any of these books or that I've written, I will uh, the 
the this one is seven fifty and that one is five dollars and that one is twenty dollars. Uh, that book is usually twenty six ninety five on the internet, but my cousins brought them out. They were here a couple of weeks ago, and they brought some cases of books to us. So uh, anyway, if you're interested in any of them, we'll get them after the class. Now go out and do something eternal. I always tell the class to go out and do something eternal. <laughs> Don't just live. Yeah. Do something eternal yeah. that you can take back to heaven with you, okay? Yeah. All right? You ready to go out there and jump on the world? Yeah. All right? Uh, Brother Bill, would you dismiss us in class? <laughs> Again, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the way in which you have preserved it by uh, or bringing our Lord and Savior into this world when Greek was uh, established and when you had the Pax Romana, which allowed the missionaries to travel. Lord, we see your marvelous plans in all of these things. And we know that even though you reveal yourself in natural revelation, that doesn't tell us anything about our salvation. You come with your special revelation through your word. And in this, you show us that we are sinners and that we can be made right with a holy God. Uh, we ask all of these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Wow, the Lakotas even had a name for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father was walking talking, the Son was talking, healing, the Holy Spirit's gone, talk to us, God's gone. <laughs> so you'll, you'll get a little bit of all of that stuff as we go. Let you go first, eh? Hi. You can read it quick. You can get it on DVD. You can listen on on the internet on on uh, one of those. Uh,